Hey guys, it's your favorite historian, Poohhead189, here to remind you I'm still in the business of making historical videos like I did those months ago. So if you were worried about me only making pop culture reviews, fret not, for here I am entering the breach once more. Today we're going to be talking about a relatively simple but contentious topic among many would-be historians, and admittedly, a few credible ones. And that is the differences between the three most successful ways of war in the Iron Age. The classical Greek way of war, the Macedonian way of war with the phalanx, used by Philip II and his son, Alexander the Great, along with their predecessors, and the Roman way of war up until the 2nd century AD. I'm just going to give the basic outline, strengths and weaknesses, and I'm going to give a disclaimer before I begin. None of these differing strategies of warfare are inherently better or worse than the others. Yes, it's true that the Macedonian phalanx overtook the Greek phalanx, and the Roman legion usurped the Macedonian phalanx. However, there have been Greek phalanxes that have defeated the Macedonian ones, and there have been Macedonian phalanxes that have defeated the Roman legions. The reason why one overtook another is varied, and has a lot to do with the politics, resources, and battlefields of different parts of history. However, if you had to press me, and if I were to give my completely subjective opinion, I'd probably say in a 1v1v1, I'd put my money on the Macedonian phalanx as the best. But I'll explain all of them, going in order chronologically to when they were implemented historically. Now let's begin with the Greek phalanx. Greek hoplite warfare began around the 7th century BC, and was without a doubt the most effective way of war in the Mediterranean for around 300 years. Greek hoplites trained in phalanx warfare were highly prized as mercenaries by every nation in the Middle East at that time. Persian kings and usurpers would always try to buy phalanx mercenaries and make them the core of the Persian armies if they could, though of course the Persians were no slouches to warfare themselves and had effective troops, but it goes to show the quality and reputation of the Greek hoplite. Unlike most soldiers in antiquity, the Greeks' main force was made up of heavy infantry fighting in tight formations. If you want more information on the hoplite's relationship with the Greek polis or city-state, see my previous video on the Greek city-states. But as for now, hoplites were citizen soldiers who were adult males who had the training and money to use and equip themselves with the standard equipment. A hoplite had a full helm that left the eyes and lower chin exposed, popularly called the Corinthian helmet. He wore a bronze breastplate or cuirass along with the bronze greaves and a heavy wooden shield overladen with bronze that weighed around 40 to 45 pounds. It was a really heavy shield. Their main weapon was an 8 to 9 foot long thrusting spear, and while they carried a short sword of iron called the Xiphos, it was practically never used in combat, and I'll explain why soon. So the Greeks, in heavy armor and perfect discipline, would march in lines eight men deep, each man hiding behind the shield of the man to his right. In classic hoplite battle, the battle lines would approach one another slowly, and at that point it would be a battle of attrition. Usual armies would never be able to break the discipline, but with hoplite armies it was a bit different. The goal was to open up a gap in the other hoplite army's line and exploit it. Let's say you're in a hoplite battle and you get a lucky spear thrust, stabbing an enemy hoplite in the face. He falls, and at that point, it was a race between you getting into that line, or the shield wall closes ranks again and seals the way shut. It was only if you happened to be that lucky hoplite that managed to not only kill an opponent, but squeeze your way into the enemy line that you would use the sword, because at that point, you could hack and stab with your short weapon with near impunity, cutting into exposed sides as you killed enemy soldiers. You would open up further gaps in the enemy lines, Hoplite battles were almost always one-sided when it came to casualties. The winner usually lost perhaps 12 men, and the loser could easily lose 200 or more. It was when the line broke that the real killing would begin. A hoplite phalanx breaking was no longer an effective unit. Instead, a bunch of men in heavy and cumbersome but exposed armor that slowed them down. When a hoplite line broke, the first thing you would do would be to throw down your shield because it's extra weight and then run for your life, because not only would you need to fear the enemy spears, but that was when the cavalry would charge in. Without a shield wall to protect you, you were hopelessly exposed. The Greeks rarely used cavalry in any real fashion other than rare flanking attacks, or to usually just chase down running hoplites. 
and the archers, javelin men, and peltasts were there to help break up enemy formations if they could. So to reiterate, in hoplite warfare, your goal was to keep in your formation while you broke the enemy's formation to where you could then slaughter them at your leisure. Now, on to the Macedonian way of war. As most of you likely know, this type of warfare was based upon the warfare of the classical Greeks. However, it makes a lot of changes, and people tend to underestimate just how revolutionary this type of warfare was, and how innovative Philip II of Macedon was in order to create it. Essentially, to make the army that he used to conquer Greece, he had to orchestrate a socio-economic revolution in Macedon. He was a military genius, and though Alexander the Great, his son, went on to conquer the known world and is, by my estimation, probably the greatest conqueror in all of human history, his father laid much of the groundwork, was highly intelligent as well when it came to military tactics, and was even more intelligent than Alexander when it came to politics and governing Greece and Macedon simultaneously. Before Philip, Macedon was a kingdom of barbarians, essentially no different than any fiefdom or kingdom in the Balkans, other than the fact that their royal house apparently had Greek blood. But when Philip II came to power after his older brother's untimely death, he reorganized the kingdom and the military. Alexander made many ingenious innovations of Philip's design later on, but I'll give the basic outline and overview of the Macedonian army. Unlike the Greek army, which as previously stated, was meant to break the enemy morale and enemy line and then slaughter those that fled, the Macedonian army used a war of annihilation strategy in a hammer and anvil attack. They had the phalanx as the main force, which was armed far differently than their Greek counterpart. The Macedonian phalanx used the sarissa, which is the earliest version of the pike, as far as we can tell. It could range from 18 to 22 feet long, far too long to hold one-handed with a shield. The phalanx stood 16 men deep, twice the width of the Greek phalanx, and every Macedonian battalion at paper-thin strength was at least 96 men long, which means a small battalion was 1,536 men. There are reports of the phalanx being segmented into smaller squadrons, and that's pretty much undisputed, but this battalion would be essentially the equivalent of a Roman legion, which was, in the Roman legion, 5,000 men, respectively. But yes, 16 men deep at least, and the line was 96 men at least. The men wore padding, wool, or leather in military jackets. The only metal armor they had was their helmets, and a small buckler or shield that they had strapped to their arm or their back. Other than with the hypacipists, it was usually a secondary or even tertiary line of defense. Their main defense was the sarissa itself. The front six of the 16 men would hold their pikes outward, so any attacker would have to pass six rows of sharp pike heads to even make it to the first man to attack. The back 10 men would hold their pikes at an angle, which according to Polybius, who was a Roman historian, or a historian who was ostracized by his rivals in Greece and moved to Rome, according to him, the pikes that were angled above the head of the front six men by the back ten men were actually good at blocking thrown or shot projectiles like rocks or arrows. The phalanx was meant to hold the enemy in place while the other main force did its work. The companion cavalry. These were noble-born men, or men of high ranking, petty lords turned into professional soldiers, and while this isn't technically true, it isn't inaccurate that they were pretty much the earliest version of the knight. They went from light cavalry to heavy lancers with a thrusting spear and heavy body armor, trained to ride in tight formations and given good close combat weapons if they became bogged down in a melee. The idea of the Macedonian way of war was to hold the enemy with the phalanx and wheel around and encircle the enemy with the cavalry and crush them with a hammer and anvil strategy, usually attacking from the right, but if they could help it, attacking from both sides. Finally, the third component of the army were the hypacipists, which were the men of the phalanx, much like the aforementioned phalanx, only, the hypacipists were made up of the most experienced and disciplined men, and they relied more heavily on their shields, or bucklers, and they guarded the flanks of the army and the gaps between the regular phalanx and the companion cavalry. And of course, just like the Greek phalanx, the Macedonians often had peltasts and mercenary cavalry forces and such. Alexander the Great did an incredible job inducting various different peoples with various different military skills into his army during his campaigns, but for now, this basic overview will suffice. Finally, we're going to speak about the Roman way of war, 
Now, Rome was a civilization that lasted for nearly a thousand years, and if we're being generous and we're counting the Byzantines, Rome lasted from the 5th century BC to the 15th century AD. So it's a huge topic to cover, but I'm only going to speak on the classic warfare we generally think of when we think of Rome, the Roman legions of the late Republic and the early Empire, probably starting around the 2nd BC onwards to the 2nd AD. Now, unlike the other two armies that we are compared with, the Roman legion did away with spears and pikes back around the 4th century BC, if memory serves. Perhaps it was around the 5th century. And it's an odd thing, to be honest. One of the greatest advantages to have in any era of warfare is reach. The ability to hurt your opponent, yet be far enough away from them that they cannot hurt you. Spears, arrows, bullets, missiles, etc. As the motto of Fallout states, I'm a big fan of video games, war never changes. However, the Romans took a different approach, and by all accounts, it worked. Now, before I continue, to reiterate once more, the Greek way of war was to break the enemy line and morale and make them flee to then cause casualties. The Macedonian way of war was to hold them and then flank them with powerful cavalry and a strategy of annihilation. The Roman way of war was to kill. It was that simple, and they waged war violently. Now, what do I mean by that? isn't all war violent, in a sense. However, for the Greeks and Macedonians, going out on a military campaign was certainly dangerous, but battles rarely had large casualties. Even in the Macedonian Battle of Encirclement and Annihilation, the majority of the enemy's forces would make it out of there and flee in disarray. But with the Romans, there was almost never a battle without high casualties. The Romans had tactics, certainly. There have been many brilliant Roman generals in history, However, they did not break morale and then kill their opponent. They broke their opponent's morale by killing them in large numbers. Unlike the other two factions, the Romans did not try to hold or break the enemy with spears. They got up close and personal, and they were trained to make every thrust and cut from their gladius, which was a short sword, usually two feet long, a kill shot. Behind their massive scutum shields, which, when interlocked, became a veritable moving wall, they halted the enemy charge and cut into them. They would stab the kidney, they would cut the neck, they would stab onto the armpit into the foe's heart. A Roman legion was essentially an armored wood chipper. And this demoralized both the Greeks and Macedonians when they first faced off against Roman legions. If you go out on military campaign expecting perhaps a fifth of the army to not make it back alive, and then nearly half of them don't, you're generally frightened. Even when a Roman army loses, they tend to inflict heavy casualties. In fact, that's where the term Pyrrhic victory came from. One of Alexander the Great's would-be imitators called Pyrrhus set sail to Italy to aid some Greek city-states that were in conflict with early Rome, and twice Pyrrhus fought the Romans and won, but each battle nearly decimated him and ruined his military career. Even in victory, he lost because of the enormous casualties his army suffered. There is nothing more bloody than a Roman civil war because they will hack at each other day and night. And the Romans didn't fight in the traditional columns that the Greeks and Macedonians did. They fought in a grid formation, where it would be easy to move a line forward or to make a line move back behind another. It was the ability to fight in a grid formation that led them to defeat the Macedonian phalanx, historically. Because while the Macedonians could hold any army, and even the Romans found it difficult to get past six pikeheads, the Macedonian phalanx was harder to maneuver over uneven ground and the Roman grid was far more flexible. They even set their camps up in a grid formation, easy to navigate and defend. And the Romans were masters of logistics with manpower and resources. And if need be, they could summon armies far larger than any Greek city-state or Macedonian kingdom, particularly once Rome expanded territory. And a Roman legionnaire with their heavy laminar upper body armor, with their overlapping plates, in their huge scutum shields, it was hard to break their defenses or discipline. Yet they also used tactical advantages and weapons other than the gladius. The Romans often began battle by throwing a pilum or a javelin, a two-foot metal barb attached to a four-foot wooden shaft. And if the pilum did not kill their opponent, it often pierced an enemy's shield and weighed it down, ruining it. And an enemy without a shield was just that much easier to cut down. They also relied on archers, of course, and while they did not use cavalry quite as much as the Macedonian way of war, they still used them to good effect. A lot of the patrons and nobles would be in the cavalry forces. 
they used cavalry far more than the Greeks, at least. And while there is a ton of stuff I've not yet touched upon, I think that does it for a basic overview of what you need to know about these three very successful ways of war in antiquity. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like or comment if you enjoyed it, and subscribe if you would want to see more in the future. Thanks, everyone.